second part in a two-part series on the costumes of The Shining. This one focuses on the outfits of Wendy and Jack Torrance. And in case you're arriving here without seeing part one, I will leave a link to that in the pinned comment below, although you don't necessarily need to see it in order. And if you want to jump ahead, I have created chapters. Just hop to the section you like. I'm picking up where we left off in the previous video, where we explored the costumes in the three time settings, 1921, 1970, and in the present timeline of the late 1970s. Wendy Torrance is the wife of Jack Torrance and the mother of Danny Torrance. She's portrayed by Shelley Duvall. In the last video, I mentioned that the costume designer, Milena Cananero, saw the characters like figurines from a catalog, so many of Danny and Wendy's costumes were actually ordered from the Sears 1977 Fall and Winter catalog. I'll share examples with you throughout the video. A lot of the costumes are preserved in the Stanley Kubrick archive at the University of the Arts London. I will mention the archives throughout the video as well. In a beautifully written letter that Shelley Duvall wrote to Stanley Kubrick back in December 1977, she tells him, Here are the selections I've made from the catalogue you sent. Many of my own clothes are close to this style. Maybe some of them can be of use. I'll bring them when I come over. Wendy's first outfit is easily one of my favourites. It's not in the archives and it doesn't appear to have been auctioned off either, so it's possible this was one of Duval's own outfits. My other thought is that the wardrobe department custom made the blue gingham pinafore dress for her. It's a rather simple house dress and typical of the period in folk costume type colors like we see in these examples from the Sears catalog and also in this vintage dress from the 1970s. Just to make it extra precious, she's wearing these golden tan leather booties with side pockets and the dress is worn over a bright red, slightly ill-fitting union suit or long underwear. Here's an example of a vintage pair to show you what they look like. On a recent watch of the Marvel series WandaVision, I couldn't help but imagine that Wanda's 1970s red, white and blue outfit is an homage to Wendy Torrance. There's a Native American thread throughout the movie, and we see a little hint of it with Wendy's Native-inspired woven belt. I'm not going to get into any fan theories here, but building on top of an Indian burial ground trope often portends to bad outcomes in horror movies. Wendy's outfit also contrasts nicely with her shiny black hair and doe brown eyes. I've seen it mentioned in other analysis that the colors convey her childlike naivete. It also ties into Danny's red, white, and blue all-American palette. Kubrick told the costume designer that he wanted the characters to look middle American. Juxtaposing this more casual, relaxed look in Boulder, Wendy dressed in a more sophisticated ensemble for the family's move to the Overlook Hotel. Having some idea about the direction of her character, Duval wrote to Kubrick in the same letter that, I think she would dress very neatly around Stuart Ullman and Edmonds and in overalls, jeans, boots around the overlook. In case you're wondering, Dr. Edmonds was a character in the book, but it appears that he was cut from Kubrick's film. Both her jacket and skirt worn with a slouchy cowl neck sweater, appear to be in the Kubrick archives. The jacket is described as a light brown blazer with two pockets on front with a tan fabric flower pinned onto the left lapel. I really appreciate this little bit of embellishment. The skirt, meanwhile, is a wool cashmere blend, checkered brown and tan with a side zip. The skirt is fan pleated or sun ray pleated. It's unlikely, given the quality of the skirt, that it came from Sears, but here are some examples showing this particular style. Her boots, meanwhile, look like these suede split leather, whatever that is, in the Sears catalog. This next look features Wendy wearing a pastel fleecy robe. In her letter to Kubrick, she imagines her character dressed in a granny flannel print nightgown and a chenille robe. From the Kubrick collection, the robe is described as blue, 
yellow, pink, and white acrylic dressing gown with patch pockets on the side front and matching belt. Here is the robe featured in the Sears catalog. Under the robe, she wears a set of white thermal pajamas with a pattern of blue snowflakes, which is also in the Cooper collection. While I don't have a picture from the archives, here are the thermals in the catalog. Duval tells Kubrick that she liked the look of an oversized plaid shirt overworn in blue jeans with fry western boots. During this one little moment of joy with Danny, Wendy is again wearing bright and happy primary colors. I couldn't get a close enough image to know for certain if Wendy is wearing western boots or not, but here is a pair of vintage 70s fry whiskey tan embroidered boots. Tell me in the comments below if you think that that's what she's wearing. The archives state that they have one of Wendy's flannel cotton shirts in their collection that appears to match the one worn here. They describe the shirt with a tartan pattern in red, blue, and green. Wendy always adds some flair, like we see with this red bandana. Here is a close-up of the hooded jacket worn likely for warmth in a behind-the-scenes photo. It's a red outer shell with a quilted blue lining. This jacket might have belonged to Deval. Wendy wears a purple corduroy coat dress with side seam pockets, a plus in any dress, and purple buttons running up the front of the collar with three buttons on each of the bishop's sleeves. According to the archives, the dress is made in Wales. It looks like she's wearing red gaiters over her shoes. In the kitchen, she adds a blue and white vertically striped cooking apron, also from the archives, with a pocket across the middle, with a black string for tying at the back and hanging around the neck. My next favorite look is this, what I refer to as Wendy's adulting outfit. Not a lot of credit is given to her, but while Jack is writing his faux manuscript, Wendy is getting the job done at the Overlook Hotel. Here's a picture of Wendy's jacket cardigan from the archives. There is a little bit of fading, but otherwise it's in really good condition. There's a note in the archives that mentions that this item was possibly custom made. The wool cardigan is embroidered around the edges with red and blue crosshatch stitching and decorated with green cacti with pink flowers, pink Native American style teepees with blue details, orange huts surrounded by green cacti and blue mountains. And then the back of this item is decorated with a sleeping man wearing a sombrero. Native motifs were popular in Western clothing in the 1970s and early 80s. Here's a great example of the same style as Wendy's cardigan. This leather and suede jacket at a time before cultural appropriation was controversial, is decorated with lightly quilted Native American figures and hand-stitched edges. The jacket was likely from the late 70s or early 80s and part of the Ralph Lauren Polo Country collection. Wendy's wearing the same pair of moccasin-like shoes that she wore before in Boulder. And I'm not sure if this is the same scarf, but there is a mention in the archives of a cashmere scarf that's made in Scotland, but I can't verify it without seeing a picture. Duval wrote Kubrick in the letter, I like the look of a bulky sweater, corduroy pants with hiking boots and thick socks and an old corduroy jacket with a fur collar and lots of pockets, which I have, like we see in her final act costume. There's a few variations of it because she adds this cardigan sweater at one point. She's wearing it here in a behind the scenes photo with actor Danny Lloyd. This type of sweater might be called Fair Isle, but I think it's more accurately an Icelandic sweater or Lopapesa, meaning unspun yarn. These sweaters were very popular in the 70s and 80s. According to Scandinavia Standard, a Fair Isle sweater is different from an Icelandic lopi in that the former refers to a technique of knitting rather than the kind of yarn used. Many Icelandic sweaters are made using the Fair Isle technique, so the two are not mutually exclusive. You can find these sweaters, by the way, all over Etsy if you're looking for one. Under this sweater, Wendy wears a tan corduroy dungaree dress. The archives describe it as 100% cotton tan corduroy overalls with metal buttons. 
They don't state what the brand is, but I thought that it might be Lee because of the black label on the bib. Here is a picture of Wendy's green and yellow plaid shirt from the archives. The top has iridescent buttons and two button-up pockets on the front. There were two shirts purchased. And it's hard to tell without a high-resolution photo, but I thought that her watch might possibly be a Timex Easy Reader. This was likely Timex's most popular watch with the slogan, It takes a lickin' and keeps on tickin'. They still make this watch today. And from the archives, the beige turtleneck sweater with elasticized wrists, waist and neck is made from a blend of cashmere and wool. There are also two pairs of off-white leg warmers in the archives like we see here. In other pictures, it appears that they go up to the thigh. And her boots look similar to these vintage 1970s Dexter winter boots. But I think that they're actually these leather and suede split leather boots with polyester fleece trim from J.C. Penney. They are in the color beige, like in this cropped image on the bottom. And finally, who can forget this robe? It actually belongs to her husband, Jack Torrance, who wore it in an earlier scene. She took off the dungaree jumper and added this when taking a nap. Can you blame her? The girl has been through a lot. The robe is described by the archives as a gray and dirty, 100% cotton bathrobe made of a thin material with pockets at waist height and a matching belt. I'm not certain if this is the screen accurate robe pictured here because it reads more blue on screen, but I'm not entirely sure. It might have faded over the years or was used in rehearsal. Jack Torrance is the main protagonist and antagonist the husband of Wendy and the father of Danny. He is played by Jack Nicholson. Jack's first look during his interview is this understated and neutral business dress, likely a leftover from his time as a school teacher. I don't think this is a two-piece suit, but more likely a sports jacket and pants because the archives mention two sets of wool blend, dark gray slacks, which is what I think these are. The archives also have two 100% wool and dark green square-ended ties like the one we see here. There was a Reddit theory that the texture of the tie, if you zoom in closely, looks like the maze. I don't think there's anything to that because these woolen ties were very popular in the 1970s and 80s. Even Stewart is wearing one during the interview scene. It is a fun theory though. Here are a couple of vintage examples of this style of tie. I think his jacket is Donegal Tweed Plain Weave. Along with Harris Tweed manufactured in the Scottish Highlands, Donegal is the most famous tweed in the world. Here's an example of this type of tweed in a 1980s sports coat. Jack's other look is in warmer tones and in the same color palette as Wendy, showing that they are Team Torrance before it all goes to hell. The look here is a bit more casual than it was in the interview, as he's not wearing a tie, although he still is wearing a sports jacket. The mossy green sweater looks like Shetland wool, again very popular in the 1970s and early 80s. Here's an example of a beautiful vintage Shetland sweater, which is made in the Shetland Islands from the wool of Shetland sheep, thus the name. Jack's sports coat is a houndstooth check with dark brown and caramel on a camel ground. There are lots of these styles of sports jackets all over the online vintage markets. Here are just a few for you to see. Since I mentioned Wanda's look paying homage to Wendy, I thought that I mentioned that Vision wears a jacket like this in the 70s themed episode. In this scene, Jack is wearing a green Stovington t-shirt. While not mentioned in the film, this is the same name of the school that Jack used to teach at in the novel. Here is one of the two pale green t-shirts from the archives. The tees are 100% cotton and USA made. One of the two tees has a light brown discoloration mark on the chest area, perhaps from when Jack Nicholson was eating breakfast in bed. Here's another earth tone look, this chunky brown cardigan sweater matched with a blue button down shirt and blue jeans. Like Wendy's sweater, this is really a nice garment. I don't have any info about it, but here is a behind the scenes photo of Nicholson wearing this outfit. 
Jack wears this muted green flannel shirt with jeans. I think that it is an Austin Reed brand, like another shirt that Nicholson wore in rehearsals. This shirt is not in the archives and was not sold at auction. Here's Nicholson's cotton made in Sweden rehearsal shirt that was later sold at auction. Now it's understandable why they would decide against this color. As thematically, he hadn't quite gone over the edge yet and the design team would save this bolder color for the final act. Here's Jack in a terry towel bathrobe, the same one that Wendy wears. He's wearing it over top a navy t-shirt and jeans. Like I said earlier, I'm not certain if the robe from the Kubrick archives is the same or not. Here's an example of this type of robe from the Sears catalog. While the shape might be slightly different, Terry robes really haven't changed that much over the years. This is one of my favorite of Jack's looks. Costume designer Milena Cannonero loves Jack in sweaters, and the color of this wool turtleneck just picks up the color of his green eyes. And I also appreciate that the sweater is well loved with the little lint balls. This outfit is the most iconic of all of Jack Torrance's looks and he spends the most time in this outfit. It's pretty simple really. It's a burgundy corduroy jacket, a plaid shirt, blue jeans and work boots. In the gold room, Jack and Lloyd the bartender are connected on the same spiritual plane by color. The bartenders are the only staff that wear this matching burgundy color. According to the costume designer, the burgundy corduroy jacket with a ribbed and elasticized waistband and brown wool was handpicked by Nicholson from his own personal wardrobe for his character to wear in these scenes. An additional 11 replicas of the jacket were created. The original jacket was made by Margaret Howell, a contemporary British clothing designer. Margaret Howell tells the story on her Instagram account. She said, in the 1970s, I supplied Maxville Bleu, a store in Los Angeles, and was thrilled to hear that one of my favorite actors, Jack Nicholson, had bought a corduroy wind cheater, style number M025, signifying my 25th design. A while later, I was amazed to receive a request from Stanley Kubrick's film production for replica jackets to use in the film The Shining since Nicholson had chosen to wear his own jacket to play the part of Jack Torrance in that film. Margaret Howell has created an updated version of the Nicholson jacket in 2020, although at last look, it appears to be unavailable on their website. The jacket was sold at Christie's auction in 2002 for £4,230 and then again at Guernsey's auction in 2008 for a reported $17,000. Italian auction house Ossie Balafi sold the jacket. I'm not sure if it's the same one or another replica in March 2018 for 24,000 euros. After a long battle of internet bids, a Californian collector won the jacket, possibly Pixar's Lee Unkrich, AKA the caretaker. Under the jacket, Jack wears a flannel shirt in white, red, green, and navy plaid. It's possible that Duval supplied Nicholson with this shirt. She told Kubrick in her letter, I have a great plaid wool shirt I got in Telluride, Colorado two years ago that will fit Jack if you like it. He likes it. According to Banff style, Jack's jeans are the classic Lee 101 rider style in dark blue salvage denim, the same model worn by James Dean in the movies Giant and Rebel Without a Cause. I talk about these jeans in greater detail in another video if you want to check that out. In this screen grab from Kubrick's Daughter's documentary, Nicholson reveals that inside of his jeans there is a little cotton pouch sewn into his jeans to hold his mic pack. I didn't catch a glimpse of his undies. If you must know, yes, I was looking for them. But according to the archives, he wore 100% cotton Y fronts in size 34 with elasticized tops. These are likely jockey brand like we see here, although I'm not sure what color Nicholson wore. Banff Style also says on their blog that Jack wears a pair of well-worn work boots that appear to be Timberland's classic six-inch waterproof boots in gold wheat colored burnished full grain leather, now offered as part of the Timberland Heritage line from Timberland. From their website, here are the men's Timberland Pro waterproof iconic work boots in wheat. 
It's also possible that there are these light tan waterproof leather boots made exclusively for Sears by Herman Bootmakers out of Fort Worth, Texas. If you've made it all the way through the costume maze, I want to thank you for spending time with me. I've had a blast making this two-part video series and revisiting not only The Shining, but some of the 70s fashions that remind me of my own youth. If you missed part one, I'll leave a link for that in the pinned comment below. I have one more video coming up about The Shining in the next month, so check that out if you enjoy this content. Until then, I'll see you in the next video.